you may already know that an assembly of transmission lines of different impedance values can be used to get a wide bandwidth flat response impedance matching circuit. However, if you tune the impedances and lengths just right, you can go the other way around, make a structure that specifically rejects signals. Kind of like a filter. Hello and welcome back. Today I want to look at a specific distributed element filter type which is built from consecutive pieces of transmission lines of varying impedances that also takes advantage of the lumped element behavior of the transmission line. This is most commonly used as a low pass filter, one that can work at very high frequency and with high power. So if you're curious about how it works and some practical examples, then keep watching. Today's video is sponsored by JLC PCB. They provide easy, affordable and reliable PCB and PCBA solutions, empowering electronics engineers to develop projects efficiently. For today's project, I used both a high-performance PTFE PCB, but also a CNC machined copper structure, both of these being, in the end, filters. Ordering a set of boards is as easy as dragging your Gerber files onto their website and setting a few configurations. Up to 8 layer boards can be obtained for as little as $2 and you can get a $30 coupon for the 6 layer boards. So even larger PCB sizes can be obtained for only $5. Easy to use, affordable to make and reliable. Check out the link in the description for more details. So first things first, one of the important things to start off with is understanding the lumped element equivalent of a transmission line. In general, we have two basic models to consider, a lossless ideal model that consists of a series inductance and a parallel capacitance, and a more advanced lossy model, which also contains a series resistance and a parallel conductance. For today's discussion, we can focus on the lossless model. So the way in which you transform a specific transmission line with a given propagation delay and characteristic impedance into its lumped element equivalent is by solving a couple equations. If you know the transmission line parameters, you can determine the inductance and capacitance. But you can also go the other way around. These two models are very important since they can accurately represent the same structure but under different use cases. So while an electrical interconnection does behave like a transmission line at high frequency, it also behaves like an LC circuit at low frequency. To illustrate this, what I have here is a piece of coax, which for the sake of this example, I will try to characterize in two different ways. First, if we treat this as a transmission line, we can measure the S11 parameter when one end is open. This provides an almost zero ohm impedance at around 53 megahertz. So at this frequency, the cable is a quarter wavelength transformer, turning an open circuit into a short circuit, a characteristic behavior of transmission lines. And after a bit of calculation, we can say that the propagation delay is 4.74 nanoseconds. And well, I know it's a 50 ohm cable since that is what I bought, but this can also be extracted from the S11 measurement using a TDR analysis. So this also gives an almost 50 ohms value. But now, if we treat this like a lumped element circuit, we can use an LCR meter that is measuring at around 100 kilohertz. And with this, we can measure a capacitance in between the inner and outer line. So this gives us about 96 picofarads. And if we short circuit the end, we can also measure the inductance, which is in the 0.4 microhenry range. Now, if we run the numbers a bit, we can observe that while the two methods didn't give exactly the same results, the capacitance is very close, it's just that the inductance is a bit off. But considering the tiny value that is being measured, this is a good enough result. The point is that the same device, a small bit of coax, can behave both like a transmission line at high frequency, but also like a lumped element circuit at low frequency. So how does this help in building a filter? Well, on the one hand, at low frequency, the transmission line model looks suspiciously like a low pass filter to begin with. And based on the line impedance, we can enhance either the specific capacitance or inductance. 
a low impedance line has more specific capacitance and a high impedance line has more specific inductance. The exact value can finally be controlled by the length of the line. And then at high frequency, we can take advantage of the reflection coefficient to determine just how much of the input signal will be attenuated based on the impedance mismatch that occurs between an input line and the filter line. To get a high reflection coefficient, we can have either a higher or lower impedance compared to the reference impedance. So finally, to make our filter, we need two constructive elements. Transmission lines that have an impedance lower than the input, which also gives us capacitance, and we combine this with lines of higher impedance, which in turn provide inductance. Assembling a set of alternating pieces will create a higher order filter with a sharper transition band, and the maximum attenuation will be controlled by the extreme impedance values. Now, I will not be going into the mathematics of how such a filter is calculated, but I will highlight some ready-made tools that do this job for you. First thing to look at is how a stepped impedance filter can be built on a PCB substrate. First tool to highlight is the Marky Microwave MicroStrip Filter Design Tool. Now, this tool can do more than just stepped impedance filters, but we're not really interested in that today. So first we need to configure it. We want a low pass type of response with the stepped impedance topology. Then we can either go for a Chebyshev or a Butterworth type of response. The latter also includes a passband ripple. And then we can play around with the cutoff frequency of interest, the interface impedance. So this typically will be 50 ohms. And finally, we end up with the PCB related parameters. So we can set some target for the low and the high line impedance. And based on the PCB substrate parameters, so the dielectric constant, the height and the conductor thickness, the tool will calculate the exact trace geometries. And finally, we can also set if we want the low or the high impedance first. So now if we just leave the default values and hit compute, we get both the geometry and the description as well as the exact response shape that we should be expecting. So with this filter at around one gigahertz, we are starting to get our attenuation. Now playing around with the parameters, you can get all sorts of different responses. So this tool is quite nice to get a quick feel for what this type of filter can actually produce and how exactly the input parameters will impact it. Now it's important to observe that while this is a low pass type of filter, it's still a transmission line filter. So while you do get your low pass corner, based on the exact build, you can also get various pass band or other phenomenon appearing at higher frequency. So it's not a low pass filter in the classical sense. Therefore, any such peaks in the transmittance need to be considered for your specific use case to see if they are acceptable or not. Anyway, to try this program out, I set it up to calculate a fifth order Chebyshev type of filter with the PCB parameters for a PTFE board. And the filter should work at one gigahertz. So for these settings, these are the dimensions that I got. And this was what I tried to finally implement. So I built the structure to the best of my abilities. Making a layout is not that easy when you need to draw it out rather than just having to interconnect components. Anyway, it's a two layer board where one layer is a full ground plane and on the other, we have our structure. And well, to prevent any issues, I left quite a bit of clearance around it. But the edge is also connected to ground with a bunch of vias. So the structure is guarded by this ground ring. Now, one important aspect to remember is that while the filter's dimensions are critical, so the trace lengths and the widths, if it does not fit on the board, you can always extend it with extra traces of the connecting impedance, which is 50 ohm in my case. So the beginning and the end segments are 50 ohms, and these could be longer or shorter. It would not affect the filter's response, other than maybe just add a bit more loss if these are too long. So the board came out looking quite nicely. And maybe one last thing to mention about it is that I removed the solder mask in the filter area. 
This is usually done to reduce losses to a minimum, since the solder mask is supposed to have a higher loss factor than air. Anyway, if we now connect this up to the VNA and test it out, the response is remarkably close to the prediction of the tool. We have our first dip at almost the same minus 35 decibels, and there's also a peak at around 3.8 gigahertz. And well, even in the pass band, we are getting a very small amount of loss. So if we just zoom in, we can see that up to 880 megahertz, it's only about 0.3 decibels. So this filter is working as expected. Now, when building filters on PCBs, there are two things to consider. First, it's quite helpful to add a shield over the filter. Leaving the board exposed like this will make it susceptible to interference. And second, while this is a great small signal filter, it's limited in its power handling capability. So another constructive option is the coaxial filter. The next tool to look at is the Chang Puak, hope I pronounced it right, Stepped Impedance Coax Low Filter Designer, a tool for the mechanic in you. So this tool has a similar interface to the previous one that we looked at. It features things like a cutoff frequency, passband ripple, and system impedance. But specifically for this type of construction, we first need to determine the exact structure type, so whether it's cylindrical or rectangular. Then we have things like the inner diameter, as well as the filter elements diameter. And finally, we can play around with the order of the filter. And if we hit calculate, first of all, we get a representation of what the filter should look like. And we also get a detailed description of each segment, so its mechanical dimensions, as well as the achieved impedances. Anyway, if you're not sure what this filter is actually supposed to look like in real life, the website also highlights a practical build, as well as the achieved results with it. So to try this tool out, I set these parameters and decided to build the structure that came out of it. To actually build this, I used an old copper pipe, then some end caps into which I soldered SMA connectors without the inner pins. And for the filter itself, I used copper wire for the high impedance bit, and some smaller copper end caps for the low impedance bit. After a bunch of soldering, the mechanic in me created quite a janky looking device. You can probably build something much nicer. But anyway, this is what I was able to do. So after a similar verification procedure, I got the following results. We have the same low pass type of behavior with the peak appearing at high frequency. But this time the attenuation in the pass band has a bit more ripple, probably because of my building skill. So the exact dimensions and distances from the calculator were much more difficult to follow when building like this compared to the PCB structure. But regardless, the filter does work quite nicely. Now, before showing you the last filter I built, I want to highlight one more computer program which can be highly useful in designing and simulating such filters. Cuke Studio. So while this program contains the filter synthesis tool, which allows a similar method of designing such filters. So here you select the stepped impedance type. Then you need to input the various parameters. So the filter response type, the order, the corner frequency, the interconnecting impedances, and then you can get the filter either as idealized pieces of transmission line. So characterized by extreme impedances, so you get this sort of thing with different lines of different impedances and different lengths. Or you can select that you want a microstrip type of implementation. So here you need to input PCB parameters. And well, this also yields good results. Now, compared to the tools we previously looked at, the first important feature here is that, for example, for the PCB, you can edit the PCB parameters and also specify a specific loss tangent. So with this parameter set to realistic values, we will get a far more realistic response. However, what I found most useful is that you can easily create any custom design that you want and just simulate it. So if you want to double check whatever you got from a different tool, or you want to verify the achieved practical implementation, 
you can easily go for that. So for example here, I tested the coaxial structure that I've previously built and saw what the white frequency response should look like. So we are getting our low pass behavior as well as a spike at around 2.6 gigahertz. And with this type of model as well, we can define the relative dielectric permittivity as well as the loss tangent. In general, with any calculation tool, it's always important to double check the results using a different tool. Just verify that the values were generated correctly. And of course, if you can model the implementation with losses, you will get much closer to what the real device will actually achieve. Most basic calculation tools just ignore the losses. So the last thing I wanted to try out was a CNC machined filter. You can machine just sections and assemble them, but I decided to be lazy and decided to get the filter in one single piece. Now for manufacturing reasons, the minimum diameter is six millimeters. So that limits a bit the minimum impedance, but regardless, this thing should be a pretty decent 2.4 gigahertz filter. Now for the ends, since I'm using SMA connectors, I put in a taper from which I go to a 50 ohm section. And after this, the actual filter starts. So this is a fifth order filter. It has three of these high impedance sections and two low impedance sections. Now, based on the dimensions that I requested, I also performed this simulation. So here we can see the response that we will be expecting. Now, although I was aiming for a corner frequency around 2.4 gigahertz, in reality, it's probably gonna be slightly lower, but that's okay. Also, we can observe that we are going to get a bit of ripple. So now let's see how this thing actually behaves. So with a great deal of pain, I was able to manage to solder some pins to this thing. Who knew copper conducts heat so well? And well, after a bit of assembly, we get a nice compact little filter. Time to test this out. Well, after running it with the VNA, the response compared to the prediction is slightly off. So the filter should have a corner at around 2.1, 2.3 gigahertz. But in reality, it seems a bit lower. Also, the slope seems to be quite steep. I guess because of the tube geometry, the ends are behaving slightly different than expected. And also the filter is probably not perfectly centered. Anyway, I guess it's better to design for a slightly higher corner frequency when building this sort of filter. On this topic, the authors of the calculation tool also reported that their filter implementation had a lower than expected corner frequency. So I guess to some extent, this is normal. In the end, the stepped impedance filter is quite an interesting type of construction, especially if you go for the coaxial build. It can offer very high power handling capability, but it will be slightly more bulky than other types of filters. However, it's also quite forgiving if the construction is not exactly perfect. So with that said, hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be up to date with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.